Our next speaker is Pastor Richard Lucas. He is a doctoral graduate from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he is pastor of teaching and preaching at First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. He has co-edited Covenantal and Dispensational Theologies, Four Views on the Continuity of Scripture, and contributed to Progressive Covenantalism. He will be speaking on the hope for theological reproachment among Calvinistic Baptists. Without further ado, Pastor Richard Lucas. Well, good morning. It's still morning. It's good to be with you all. I want to begin by just expressing thanks to Zach Max, President of Providence Theological Institute of New Covenant Theology, for the kind invitation to speak to you all today. And also to Pastor Bill Sasser, pastor of our host church here in Franklin, Tennessee. I'm very encouraged when I hear about faithful pastors that have been faithfully pastoring the same congregation for many, many years, as Pastor Bill has and is doing so in a way that exalts Christ and is doctrinally driven. And uh, the fact that this church is hosting this conference is testament to that ministry. And uh, our brother, Greg, Ramco Greg Vancourt, gave a wonderful opening message. I, uh, I told him he should just get up here again and just do something else. It was so good. Uh, but uh, he insisted I come up. So I want to begin by just reading just a few verses of Scripture and then opening in, in prayer today. I'm going to read Psalm 133, the whole psalm, just three verses. A song of a sense of David. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls in the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we um, want those words to ring true this morning, how blessed it is when brothers dwell in unity. All Christians, we are saved by the same Savior. We confess the same Lord. We share in the same Spirit. And Father, we have the same hope of Christ's return. I pray, Father, that uh, the message we are about to hear this talk that I'm to give would just be a step to help develop some unity among those that maybe don't see as much as there is, so that we can be about the common commission you've given us to reach the nations of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that he would be exalted in all things and everything we do, including today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, the title of my talk this morning is The Hope for Theological Reproachment Among Calvinistic Baptists. I assume some explanation and context is needed for this title. When I proposed this title to Zach, which he graciously accepted, I suspect that it might be on the slightly more academic nature of the talks offered at the conference. But then I saw all of Greg's Greek and Hebrew words, and I was like, oh, okay, we'll fit right in. <laughs> but I, um, I, uh, I also hope that this could be excessively informative and an encouragement to all of you who care about such matters. I was partly inspired to give this talk by the messages that Zach gave last year. I listened to them online, and he sent me a copy, a paper copy of them at my request. I found them very helpful and confirming of how I was analyzing theological developments as well. He spoke on comparing New Covenant theology and progressive covenantalism. In his papers last year, he outlined eight areas of common ground that are shared by both New Covenant theology and progressive covenantalism, before then enumerating five areas of disputable differences. Those disputable differences are areas where New Covenant theology accepts a variance of positions, but progressive covenantalism does not, the way Zach outlined it. What I hope to do in this talk is similar, but a little broader. From my limited interactions with Zach, I take it that part of what motivated him to prepare those messages was an attempt at fostering unity between advocates of New Covenant theology and progressive covenantalism. In a similar manner, part of what is animating me to deliver this particular talk is a desire I have 
for more unity among Calvinistic covenantal credo Baptists in general. Most Baptists, at least in the United States, I think it's fair to say, are much more dispensational when it comes to eschatology and ecclesiology, and something less than Calvinistic when it comes to soteriology. So even though Baptists are the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, the particular stripe drawn to a conference like this, that is non-dispensational Baptists who love the doctrines of grace, our particular variety is definitely the minority. And yet, I believe if you're at this conference, you already recognize that within this relatively small group of non-dispensational Calvinistic Baptists, we have several theological subgroups. Zach compared two of them last year, namely New Covenant Theology and Progressive Covenantalism. I want to continue that comparison, but add two more groups. Specifically, what has come to be called 20th century Reformed Baptist Covenant Theology and also 1689 Federalism. Those four different theological groups all fit under my banner, that I'm using today at least, of Calvinistic Covenantal Credo Baptists. Perhaps it might help to paint a bit of a word picture to explain how I'm seeing the theological landscape today. Imagine with me a forest of trees. And this forest, in my analogy, is a Baptist forest. That is, all of the trees in this particular forest are Baptists. There are other forests, of course, representing other denominations, such as Lutheran forests and Anglican forests and Presbyterian forests. But here, we're just talking about this Baptist forest that we're all in. And all the trees in this Baptist forest, at least in the modern United States version of this Baptist forest, are dispensational and non-Calvinistic. But there's one tree in this whole forest that's different. It's a credo-baptist tree in a credo-baptist forest, but it's a Calvinistic covenantal tree. And this particular tree coming out of the trunk has two major branches. One branch calls itself Reformed Baptist. It loves the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith and says it advocates for new covenant theology. The other branch coming out of this tree advocates for new covenant theology, and if you're looking for some confessional connections, it probably prefers the first London Baptist Confession instead of the 1689 Second London. It's hard to know exactly what to call this other branch, but for simplicity, we'll call them Sovereign Grace Baptists or New Covenant Baptists, maybe. Okay. So again, just stick with the analogy for a second. Baptist forests, all dispensational and non-Calvinist except for one Calvinistic covenantal tree. And this tree has two main branches, one that's Reformed Baptist producing covenant theology, and the other producing New Covenant theology. These two branches are in the same larger tree, but they're growing away from the shared trunk. However, in the last 10 to 20 years, two new limbs have sprouted out of these two branches one limb on each branch. And these new limbs that are growing out are actually growing towards each other, even though the branches they're coming from are growing away from each other. And they're growing back towards the middle of the tree. Progressive covenantalism is the limb growing out of the new covenant theology branch and is growing back towards the middle of the tree. And at the same time, 1689 federalism is the other limb growing out of Reformed Baptist covenant theology that is also growing towards the middle of the tree. 1689 federalism and progressive covenantalism are growing towards each other, but they're coming from opposite directions. So in my conception of the theological landscape today, there are four varieties of non-dispensational Calvinistic covenantal credo Baptists. If we want to chart them very broadly from more continuity to more discontinuity, then on the continuity side, first comes the cumbersomely named 20th century Reformed Baptist covenant theology. Then moving towards discontinuity would be 1689 federalism. Next would be progressive covenantalism. And finally, on this very narrow spectrum, New Covenant Theology represents the most discontinuity among these four groups. So in the title of my message today, when I'm referring to theological reproachment 
between Calvinistic Baptists. These are the groups of Calvinistic Baptists I am referring to. And even more specifically, I'm primarily even more narrowly going to argue that there's a fresh opportunity for theological reproachment between Reformed Baptist and New Covenant Baptist in these newer limbs growing out of these larger branches. 1689 Federalism comes from Reformed Baptists, and Progressive Covenantalism primarily comes from New Covenant Baptists, and they are growing in opposite directions, but ironically, they're arriving closer to each other. One more definitional clarification that's already too long of an introduction. I use the term hope in my title to fit with the conference theme. Had to fit in somehow. Uh, in common conversation, as Greg pointed out, often people functionally equate the word hope with nothing more than a wish. Like if someone bought a lotto ticket, which I don't recommend, and they said, I hope I win. Well, I mean, they don't actually think they're going to win. They just wish they would, right? That's the wishful thinking Greg was describing. Now, theologically, we know that hope in the Bible is a confident expectation. We have a confident expectation in the blessed hope of Christ's return. That's vastly more certain than a mere wish. When I talk about the hope for theological reproachment between Calvinistic Baptists today, I mean something more than a wish, but something less than a confident expectation. I would like to argue there's a fresh opportunity for theological reproachment among Calvinistic Baptists because of the respective developments represented by 1689 Federalism and Progressive Covenantalism. So I want to tackle this subject today in two major parts. First, a little history, and then some theology. So first, some historical background to these movements in general, and then my personal engagement with that history. So backing up a little bit, Almost all English-speaking Baptists today trace their lineage back to the 17th century British Particular Baptists. That is where we come from, historically. Don't come from the Anabaptist, don't come from the General Baptist, don't primarily come from the Continental Baptist, don't even originate with uh, American Baptists. It's from the 17th century British Particular Baptists if you're in the English-speaking world, especially England, Wales, Scotland, uh, those countries, primarily. There's a few exceptions here and there, but that's where we all historically come from. However, by the middle of the 20th century, because of a combination of fundamentalism and dispensationalism and revivalism, most Baptists in the United States were more committed to free will in the nation of Israel than anything resembling their particular Baptist reformational heritage from the 17th century. But, a small group of Baptists, especially in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States, started discovering afresh the doctrines of grace. Through the influence of men like A.W. Pink, and from a distance, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Ernie Riesinger influenced and brought together men like Walt Chandry and Albert Martin. Carlisle, Pennsylvania became affiliated with Banner Truth and their Puritan paperback to expose many to the five solas and the five points of Calvinism. And it wasn't long before their dispensationalism was also abandoned with their Arminianism. Their new theological and historical heroes from the Reformation and Puritan eras held to covenant theology, so this biblical theological system replaced their dispensationalism. They went looking for the modern-day heirs of this tradition, and they connected with Westminster Theological Seminary in the Philadelphia region. Again, they're in the Mid-Atlantic area. John Murray's towering influence over that seminar at that time, and specifically his formulation of covenant theology, undeniably influenced these new Reformed Baptists. Murray emphasized the unity of the covenant of grace throughout the whole Bible and the gracious nature of the old covenant as an administration of that unified covenant of grace. This covenantal formulation was a theological oasis in an ocean of dispensationalism, of their day. Though they learned from the feet of Reformed Pado Baptists, either in person or through their writings, they maintained their Credo Baptist convictions. So as they sought a confessional heritage and imitation of their Pado Baptist friends, they discovered the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith as a baptized version 
of the Presbyterian Westminster Confession of Faith. David Dykstra and Tom Chantry date the start in their history of this movement. They date the start of the modern Reformed Baptist movement to 1959, when Grace Baptist Church in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, formally adopted the 1689 Confession as their church's confession. Now, the next part of the story could be told better, I'm sure, by many others at this conference than me. I've only read about it. Some of you have lived some of this, as you told. But in the early days of this Calvinistic revival among these Mid-Atlantic Baptists, Ernie was not the only Riesinger to be influential. His brother John Riesinger was also part of this embrace of the doctrines of grace and rejection of dispensationalism. But as the movement developed and crystallized, there was a theological separation. John Riesinger and Ernie Riesinger and their personal separation are emblematic of the theological separation that took place in these days. John Riesinger, as well as men like Gary Long and John Zenz with others, thought that many in this new Reformed Baptist movement were really just, really, wet Presbyterians. And were missing the newness of the new covenant and the emphasis on the law of Christ replacing the law of Moses. Our rest in Christ and the superiority of his high priestly work was being eclipsed by a focus on the old covenant Decalogue and the binding authority of the Sabbath command. Extra-biblical, theological, and historical categories especially the theological covenants of redemption, works, and grace, were overriding the biblical emphasis on the new covenant replacing the old covenant. So this other branch of Calvinistic Baptists found the first London Baptist Confession of Faith more amenable. Gary Long wrote in his 1980 preface to the republished version of the first London Confession of Faith that, quote, there is a distinctive new covenant emphasis concerning biblical law in the 1644 and 1646 editions of the first line of confession that is distinctly lacking in the old covenant emphasis of the Westminster and 1689 London confessions, end quote. So the start of this new covenant theology movement is usually traced back to the 1977 article by John Zenz titled, Is There a Covenant of Grace? That's where New Covenant Theology begins, formally speaking. That article was specifically responding to John Murray's influential little book on, titled, The Covenant of Grace. Though we sometimes think of the Reformed Baptist Movement and the New Covenant Baptist Movement today as two separate movements, in the early days of this Credo baptist calvinistic revival in the second half of the 20th century, it was much more unified. I want to highlight that these two branches shared the same trunk, even if they have grown apart over time. But I also want to highlight that this early Reformed Baptist movement was certainly formed in reaction to the dominant dispensationalism and Arminianism of the mid-20th century in the United States. But just like the early Reformed Baptist movement was also a reaction movement, so was New Covenant Theology. It was specifically formulated in response to and reaction from the other branch of this Calvinistic Baptist tree. The main emphases of Zen's 1977 article were main essential tenets of New Covenant theology today. Here's a brief summary of the points he made in that seminal article back in 1977. You can Google and find this online, too. It's, it's not even that long. Here's, here, here's my summary of that article. You'll probably find some of this familiar. First, rather than appealing to terminology found in a historic confession, New Covenant theology maintained an emphasis on using biblical terminology in their systematic articulation. Second, this then led them to reject, or at least not utilize, terminology such as the covenant of redemption, covenant of works, covenant of grace, preferring instead to speak of God's plan or purpose, where no historic covenant is specifically named in Scripture. Thirdly, they argue that the specific formulation for the covenant of grace as, quote, one covenant with different administrations, end quote, flattens out the progress of revelation reflected in the biblical covenants and provides the theological rationale for infant baptism. Fourth, it's therefore better to speak of the biblical covenants, plural, and recognize that they find their fulfillment in the new covenant. Fifth, because Christians are members of the new covenant, which has been fulfilled and replaced 
which has fulfilled and replaced the Mosaic Covenant, we are now under the law of Christ and not the law of Moses as a binding authority and rule of life today. The historic distinctions in the Old Covenant law as moral, civil, and ceremonial are foreign to the biblical text and not a hermeneutical guide to determining what is applicable for Christians in the New Covenant. Lastly, this all leads them to reject both dispensationalism and covenant theology as suitably biblical and therefore pursue an alternative third way as a mediating position of sorts between, between dispensationalism and covenant theology. All that is, I'm hoping to present as objective history. That's just what happened. And that's what people believed and that's where it came from. My own personal engagement with this movement came almost by accident. I was raised in a church that assumed dispensationalism was correct. It wasn't a major point of teaching per se, but we did thoroughly enjoy listening to all the dramatic readings of the Left Behind books on family vacations. I was sure that Nikolai Carpathia was the Antichrist. And we would leave our clothes behind when we got raptured, apparently. So, um, if you don't know the movies, that's what happens in the movies. So, uh, I, I grew up in Philadelphia, so I too was raised in this mid Atlantic region. I went off to what was then called Baptist Bible College in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. It's since been renamed Clark Summit University. I went there at the recommendation of two of my pastors who were alumni, and it was there that I began a more academic study of dispensationalism. It was either assumed or taught explicitly in really all of my Bible classes. There was a required course, even in the curriculum, fully devoted to the subject of dispensationalism. Charles Ryrie came to lecture at our school more than once during my student days. I even got him to sign my Greek New Testament. I listened to lengthy tape series on Daniel and Revelation by top dispensational scholars and learned a lot from them. We even cheered on faculty members who were writing against progressive dispensationalists because they were veering away from Ryrie's sine qua non of dispensational identity. They're perverting pure dispensationalism, so uh, we couldn't even accept the progressive variety. However, in the midst of all this dispensational indoctrination, I was also learning the Bible, and I was in being introduced to the doctrines of grace, more or less. And as, I was and as I was advancing in my studies, I was also being exposed to wider evangelical scholarship. And in time, I started to question the dispensational assumptions that I previously defended. I had a nagging questions when I looked more closely at how the New Testament was using the Old Testament. Because I was primarily inter interested in the Reformational theology, I actually started attending the Philadelphia Conference on Reformation Theology held at 10th Presbyterian Church, church formerly pastored by James Montgomery Boyce. And I visited Westminster Seminary, just a few miles from my house, for the conferences they had. I even went there as a prospective student. For the longest time, though, I actually still wanted to go to the Master's Seminary. There, there may be a, a third kind of tree in this Baptist forest, because they are Calvinist, but dispensational. They can have their own tree, too. Um, uh, but, but, now, but now Westminster... Westminster Seminary was now an option on the table for me, but not only did I find the paedo baptism completely implausible, I was not able to find the covenant theology to be biblically tenable. It all seemed to be a superstructure that was forced upon the text. It used lots of terms and categories I just didn't see in the Bible when I heard the Westminster profs talk about covenant theology. So here I was, I was stuck. I didn't know where to turn. I thought these were the only options. And neither seemed all that appealing to me as I was trying to understand how the whole Bible fit together. That was the current status of my theological development when one day my Greek professor at the time invited me and some others to go to some conference. None of us, including the professor, who was a committed dispensationalist, mind you, had ever heard of this conference. But my prof heard who the main speaker was and assured us that we need to go hear him. I didn't really know this man at the time either. So a handful of us piled in a car and we drove an hour and a half south to New Ringhold, Pennsylvania and showed up at the Blue Mountain Christian Retreat and Conference Center to hear Don Carson give six expositions on the book of Hebrews at the 2002 John Bunyan Conference. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I was completely captivated by what I heard. Several other things were also happening at that conference which proved to be highly influential. 
It was also at that conference, the 2002 John Bunyan Conference, I was a junior in college at the time, that the brand new book, hot off the press, was being released. New Covenant Theology, Description, Definition, Defense by Tom Wells and Fred Zaspel. I'd never even heard of New Covenant Theology, but the authors were there signing copies, and they were going like hotcakes. Also speaking at that very same conference was Steve Wellam, a young professor, still in his 30s at the time, from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And two seminary students traveled with Dr. Wellam to this Bunyan conference from Louisville, and we met each other, we ran into each other at the bookstore. They knew much more about this new covenant theology than I did. And they assured me that if I really wanted to study more of it, then I definitely need to go to Southern Seminary and take classes with Steve Wellam, Peter Gentry, and Tom Schreiner in systematic theology, Old Testament, and New Testament. What some have later called the Baptist Covenantal Trinity. Maybe just trifecta is better. We don't want to blaspheme. So, uh, following the Bunyan Conference, I got a copy of the Sound of Grace media catalog, and I ordered the whole tape series by Don Carson on Hebrews. But I also ordered a bunch of other tape series from other Bunyan conferences. I ordered series by Doug Moo in the law. I ordered series by Fred Zaspel and John Riesinger on fulfillment and theological systems. I also got various series by Michael Haken related to church history and series by both S. Lewis Johnson and Roger Nicole on atonement. I also got my own copies of Abraham's Four Seeds by John Riesinger and New Covenant Theology by Wells and Zaspel. New Covenant Theology was starting to scratch the theological itch that I had. It was beginning to put the pieces together for me. I had a lot of questions, and I didn't have all the answers yet, but I knew I was heading down a much better path. And I knew I still had much to learn, but this was the teaching I wanted more of. So I went off the next year, a year or so later, the Southern Seminary, and I had Steve Wellam as my first Sunday school teacher, and he spent the whole year going through the book of Hebrews. And then I took advanced Christian theology with Dr. Wellam in my first year. And two other students would, and I would continue a private class unplanned with him for about an hour as we just kept peppering with questions after class, and so we just migrated to his office. We didn't pay for that one or get credit for it, but I learned just as much. We were doing that every week. I sat under Tom Schreiner's preaching every Sunday, and eventually had him for classes too. I joined Peter Gentry's shepherding group and took his Old Testament class where he spent hours and hours teaching meticulously through the biblical covenants. I moved away from Louisville in 2011, but the next year after I moved away, Kingdom Through Covenant was published in 2012. And my claim to fame was that in a footnote in the first chapter, Wellam gave me credit for suggesting to him the label of progressive covenantalism as the name for his biblical theological system that was an alternative to both covenant theology and dispensationalism. Might be a claim to fame in some circles. Maybe it's a term of derision here. So. Uh, if you uh, want to ask in the Q&A more of the rationale for that, I'm happy to share that. I, I had it in here and I cut it out for the sake of time. So for the sake of time, I'll, I'll refrain from saying more on the origin of the term progressive covenantalism, but there's, in, but there's interest later I can comment on it. I've, I had already heard much of that material that was in Kingdom Through Covenant in the classes I took with Steve Wellam and Peter Gentry, and I knew the book was forthcoming for several years. They were working on it. So when the book released, there, it wasn't really that much of a surprise to me what the content itself but the mixed reception by some was a surprise. Some wrote the book off because of its association with New Covenant theology. Because Wellam had originally, in the first edition at least, referred to progressive covenantalism as a species or a subset of New Covenant theology. In my tree analogy, it's a limb growing off that branch, but heading in the opposite direction. Some critics, even more recently, Scott Swain, president of RTS Orlando, who's even referred to progressive covenantalism as New Covenant Theology 2.0. That could be helpful or could not be, depending on what you mean by that. About a year after uh, Kingdom Through Covenant came out, was published, someone sent me a link for this new website, 1689federalism.com. And there were lots of charts and nicely produced videos, and it was clear that this website was promoting Reformed Baptist Covenant Theology. One of the videos even compared 1689 Federalism to New Covenant Theology and Progressive Covenantalism. It kind of just lumped them together as one view in its comparison. And even though there were Reformed Baptists around for a while, and they of course held to the 1689 Confession, no one before 2013 had used the term 
1689 Federalism before. It was coined by the proprietor of the website, Brandon Adams. So I got the footnote in the book, he got a website, I guess. So. And uh, what, what became apparent was that the people on this website were using this term, 1689 Federalism, to signify a specific version of Reformed Baptist covenant theology. Maybe a 2.0 for them. Not quite. They want to claim it's the 1.0, actually. But they were claiming that the Baptists from the 17th century, those 17th century British particular Baptists that all English-speaking Baptists in the United States come from, they were claiming that they already had, 400 years ago, a specific formulation of covenant theology that was different from their Pado baptist contemporaries, including the version of Presbyterian covenant theology expressed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. 1689 Federalism is a retrieval movement in that it's seeking to retrieve the specific Baptist, Baptist covenant theology that stands behind and is reflected in the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. This version of Baptist covenant theology was virtually lost for several hundred years, basically is the claim, and now they're seeking to retrieve it. But 1689 federalism is not only a retrieval effort, but it's also a reaction and reform effort. When the website first debuted in 2013, there was not only a video comparing 1689 federalism to New Covenant theology and progressive covenantalism, as I just described, and not only with dispensationalism, a different video, and Westminster federalism, a different video, which is to be expected because they're the two main alternative theological systems. They also had a video comparing 1689 federalism with what they called 20th century Reform Baptists. This was a new limb sprouting off of the Reform Baptist branch. Their claim is that even though these Reform Baptists embraced the 1689 confession in the second half of the 20th century, they just adopted the same covenant theology as the Presbyterians. In fact, they didn't even know that there was a Baptist covenant theology articulated by the 17th century British particular Baptist to be retrieved because all those works were lost. They were unpublished or not republished. Unless you're digging around a used bookstore around London, you would never find these works until early English books online made them all available at the turn of the 21st century. So now scholars for the first time in a couple hundred years have access to these works that were lost by our Baptist forefathers. So now anybody can look these up. Even Lagos has a 17 volume collection you can buy of these works online and now people are starting to republish and resource these works by our baptist covenantal forefathers that were lost now they're becoming available so within a year of each other 2012 for progressive covenantalism 2013 for 1689 federalism so really just the last 10 12 13 14 years there were two newly articulated options for the non-dispensational Calvinistic credo baptists Instead of only covenant theology or new covenant theology, now there was also progressive covenantalism and 1689 federalism. In many ways, these new views were competing for the same constituency, namely non-dispensational Calvinistic credo baptists Remember, there's only one tree in the whole forest. There's not a lot of them. But they're all aiming for the same, to capture the same people. So naturally, there's been a lot of discussion around both of these since they both kind of showed up in the scene around the same time and were talking in similar categories, aiming for a similar constituency. However, as time has gone on in the last decade or so, I was convinced that a lot of people were making superficial comparisons between these views. They didn't deeply understand each view or were focusing on surface level comparisons. In my estimation, proponents of progressive covenantalism and 1689 federalism were largely talking past each other because of a continued misunderstanding. This lack of understanding springs from a variety of factors, including different vocabulary and terminology, different historical development and origins, different conversation partners, different ecclesiological settings, and also quite frankly, in many cases, at least online, a lack of deep understanding of their own professed view. They're saying, I hold this view, but they didn't really understand it as well as they should have. So I wrote an article a little over a year ago for the Southern Baptist Journal of Theology that Brent co-edits with Steve Wellham 
titled The Past and Future of Baptist Covenantal Theology, Comparing 1689 Federalism and Progressive Covenantalism. I wrote it in part because Dr. Wellman asked me to, <laughs> but also because I wanted to give concentrated attention to sorting out some of this comparison. I'll refer you to that published article if you want more specifics to anything I'm saying today. It's online for free. But in the rest of our time this morning, I want to help show how some theological developments within Reformed Baptist circles, specifically with this limb of 1689 federalism, represents some significant movements that brings their version of Baptist covenant theology a lot closer to our branch, especially the progressive covenantal limb coming out of the New Covenant theology branch. With these limbs growing closer to each other theologically, there's some fresh opportunities, fresh hope for approachment. So I want to give a few examples of how these limbs are growing closer together. Maybe it's just important to say, just colloquially, 1689 federalism is not your granddaddy's Reformed Baptist Covenant theology. There's significant differences that could be obscured if you're just looking at it at the surface level. Because they're going to use a lot of the same language, but they mean something very different that's much more compatible with what we're saying. But you have to dig down below the surface to see that. So, let me try to give some examples of what I'm talking about. Zach said I can go as long as I want. So. <laughs> Until you say, so start walking out for lunch, then I'll know it's time to stop. All right. Uh, so, it's with respect, so first, the covenant of grace. I mean, that's an obvious difference, right? Some people are saying the whole of the covenant of grace. Some are saying there is no covenant of grace. That's where the new covenant theology movement started. Is there a covenant of grace? John Zen's answer was no, right? And he's writing in contrast to John Murray, who is arguing for the covenant of grace, right? So it seems like a pretty obvious separation between these two Baptist covenantal theologies. Well, it's with respect to the covenant of grace that both 1689 federalism and progressive covenantalism differ most distinctly from classic Paedo-Baptist covenant theology. Though they respond to Paedo-Baptist arguments from the covenant of grace in different ways, they share a common concern that goes to the heart of their respective Baptist covenantal formulations. Reformed Paedo-Baptists appeal directly to covenant theology, and specifically the covenant of grace, and their defense for infant baptism. If you run into any informed Presbyterian, that's what you're going to say. Well, look, covenant of grace. One covenant through the whole Bible, just a different administration from the old and the new. Just like they admitted people based on their parents' faith in the Old Testament, they, gave them the, they administrated it differently, you know, uh, circumcision to the male offspring. In the New Testament, they administrated it differently, uh, sprinkling water on both the boys and the girls. But again, based on your parents' faith, not your faith. And it's, it's one covenant of grace. That's what they say. Therefore, infant baptism. That's, 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 that's the argument, in essence. Okay? So, that, that argument is summarized... In the language of the Westminster Confession of Faith, Article 7, it says the covenant of grace is one in substance but varied in administration. So this paradigm has the effect of linking together the old and new covenants. The old's not replacing, the, the new's not replacing the old, it's just renewing it. It's not, it's not a new covenant, it's just a renewed covenant, right? So there's really one covenant in substance and not two different covenants. Because the nature of the old covenant is such that natural descendants were included in the covenant, it must also be true of the new covenant. So the change in the covenantal sign from circumcision on the male infant offspring under the old covenant to baptism on the all infant offspring under the new covenant is merely an external administrative difference, not one of internal essence. So, Presbyterians argue for the mixed nature of the people of God. So in their churches, they admit on purpose into their membership unregenerate with regenerate people. Right? I mean, the babies, they don't, they don't, they're not necessarily claiming they're all regenerate, but they're still full members of the covenant. So, this covenant community remains the same throughout all the administrations of this one covenant. This unity of substance is deemed necessary by Reformed theology to argue for one salvation and one people of God throughout the Testaments, but it also provides the theological rationale that it's fundamental to paedo-baptism. 17th century... Baptists also affirm unity in salvation across the Testaments, so they retain the language of the covenant of grace in concert with their Reformed paedo baptists because they wanted to say, we don't hold to different ways of salvation in the Old New Testament. So they're using that language to communicate that truth, which we agree with. 
But they didn't want to concede the foundation of paedo-baptist covenantal reasoning. So they, at least the vast majority of them anyway, rejected the language from the Westminster Confession. They, re they, they didn't utilize the language of one covenant and substance under various administrations for explaining the relation between the old and new covenants. That's why that language does not appear in the corresponding article in the Second London, 1689, London Baptist Confession of Faith, Article 7. It doesn't use that same language on purpose because it doesn't want to pull over the argument for paedo-baptism. So in moving away from Westminster Federalism on this point, 1689 Federalism, or let me back up, in, in, instead, instead of the Westminster Federalism language, 1689 Federalism summarizes the covenant of grace as one covenant revealed progressively and concluded formally under the new covenant. Now that's getting a lot closer. Hmm. And moving away from Westminster Federalism on this point, 1689 Federalism is simultaneously moving away from 20th century Reformed Baptists who also adopted the language they learned from Pado Baptists to describe the covenant of grace. So if you read, I'm going to skip it, but if you read works by, say, Earl Blackburn or Walt Trantry, they use the same language to describe the covenant of grace that you find in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the same language that Pado Baptists used to defend infant baptism. But that's not the language used by these newer Reformed Baptists. They intentionally don't use it, and it's also not found in the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And when we go back and read all the Baptists that were first ascribing to and producing that second London Baptist Confession of Faith, and we read their fuller arguments of their polemics against Pado baptists we see even more fully that they specifically rejected that argument, and they devised a different formulation for how to put the covenants together, emphasizing the newness of the new covenant that was lost until more recently. So, progressive covenantalism likewise wants to maintain a continuity of God's one redemptive plan throughout the biblical covenants, but also account for significant covenantal differences, especially between the old and new covenants. In fact, Wellam plainly states in the Four Views book that Brent and I edited, progressive covenantalism does not deny the theological concept of the covenant of grace if one merely means the one plan of God. So if that's what they mean, well then sure, we're fine with that. However, just as our Baptist forefathers noted, the Reformed paedo Baptists intend more with their use of that language. So Wellam issues this caution, which is worth quoting in full. This is from an article he wrote in 2006. He writes, if we are not careful, however, the notion of the covenant of grace may be misleading because scripture does not speak of only one covenant with different administrations, the Westminster Federalism argument. Rather, scripture speaks in terms of a plurality of covenants, which are all part of the progressive revelation of the one plan that God is ultimately, that ultimately is fulfilled in the new covenant. In reality, the covenant of grace is a comprehensive theological category, not a biblical one. That does not mean that it's illegitimate, in theology, we often use theological terms that are not found specifically in Scripture, like the Trinity. If the theological category, the covenant of grace, is used to underscore the unity of God's plan of salvation and the essential spiritual unity of the people of God in all ages, then it's certainly helpful and biblical. And if that's what someone means and all that they mean by it, well, then we mean the same thing, even if we don't prefer that language. But if it is used to flatten the relationships, especially between the Old and New Covenant, and downplay the significant amount of progression between the biblical covenants, which then leads us to ignore specific covenantal discontinuities across redemptive history, then, unfortunately, the term becomes unhelpful, misleading, and illegitimate. So, with this context in mind, and directed specifically at Reformed paedo baptist Wellam then makes this proposal. In order to make headway, in the baptismal divide, and to think biblically regarding the relationships between the covenants, we should place a moratorium on the covenant of grace as a category when speaking of the biblical covenants and the relationships between them. In its place, let us speak of the one plan of God or the eternal purposes of God centered in Jesus Christ, for that is what the language of the covenant of grace is seeking to underscore. End quote. So, progressive covenantalism is not necessarily unwilling to use the language of the covenant of grace as long as it is defined as the one plan of God, but to avoid misunderstanding and to make headway in discussing these matters of Reformed paedo baptists progressive covenantalism prefers to leave aside this theological terminology with its paedo baptist baggage in favor of biblical language. 
Unfortunately, some Reformed Baptists, especially this new variety, have misunderstood Wellam to be rejecting more than he intends. So Wellam clarifies. He writes that Sam Ranahan, quote, wrongly assumes we deny the covenant of grace because we do not define it the way he does. Meanwhile, 1689 Federalists, following the precedent of their historic Baptist forefathers, re they retain the language of the covenant of grace, but also define it differently than Reformed Paedo-Baptists. Their solution to this tension is not to speak of the covenant of grace as an overarching theological category under which all the biblical covenants are subsumed, but to equate the covenant of grace with a specific historical covenant. 1689 Federalism posits that the covenant of grace is the new covenant. Like progressive covenantalism, 1689 Federalism also wants to highlight the progressive unfolding of God's plan of redemption through the covenants. So they speak of the, quote, new covenant of grace existing as a promise in Genesis 3.15 and being progressively revealed until it is fully realized and included in the new covenant when it's established by Christ. That's the language from the First London Confession, the same one that Gary Long republished. Christ is the mediator of the new covenant of grace. That's what these 1689 Federalists are arguing is actually meant by the term in the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. The 1689 Confession, when it uses the term covenant of grace, means the new covenant of grace is their argument. And they have a lot of historical underpinnings to support that. So the, the, point, the point I want to highlight is that both 1689 Federalism and Progressive Covenantalism redefine the covenant of grace to distinguish their view from Reformed Pado Baptist covenant theology. Progressive Covenantalism goes the route of redefining it as the only the one plan of God, and 1689 Federalism goes the route of redefining it as only the new covenant. But both of these views recognize the same insight that was expressed by John Zenz in his critique of John Murray's work on the covenant of grace when he was initiating new covenant theology. They both agree that the typical formulation of the covenant of grace found in traditional covenant theology does flatten out the differences between the Old and New Covenant, and it also is appealed to in support of paedo baptism 1689 Federalism chooses to retain the language but redefine it. Progressive Covenantalism usually chooses to not use the language of the covenant of grace, even though we can find that language in the First London Confession. So, maybe we can find some wording from the First London as a basis of agreement. The new covenant of grace. If that's what both sides mean, I'm happy to use the language. Two other points related to the covenant of grace. Again, going back to the seminal article by Zenz, new covenant theology has framed itself as a third way, something different than covenant theology and dispensationalism, right? That's, you know, we're not dispensationalists, we're not covenant theology, we're something, something uh, a third way. Wellam and Gentry specifically frame progressive covenantalism as not just a third way, but actually a middle way between covenant theology and dispensationalism. Their view is not dispensational on the one hand, and it's also not paedo baptist covenant theology on the other hand. It's a Baptist covenantal view. Well, here's the thing. Similarly, 1689 Federalism is also carving out a middle way as a distinctly Baptist version of covenant theology. Pascal Deneau, in the 2013 book that came out, that kind of was the impetus for the website. He describes the novelty and difficulty that the 17th century Baptist faced in attempting to carve out this via media in their day. Except in the 17th century, the radical discontinuity group to avoid was not the dispensationalists, Darby wasn't alive yet, it was the Socinians. So he writes, regarding the covenant of grace, the Baptist position was in some ways a midway between the strict continuity of the Presbyterian position, covenant theology, and the radical discontinuity of the Socinians, we might say, the dispensationalists today. In agreement with the Presbyterians against the Socinians, the Baptists affirm the unity of substance of the covenant of grace from Genesis to Revelation, namely, there's only one way of salvation, is what he's saying, for the whole Bible. We would agree with that. However, like the Socinians against the Presbyterians, they affirm the discontinuity between the substance between the Old and New Covenants. Again, we agree with that. The new covenant is not the old covenant. It replaces the old covenant because the old covenant can't save by itself. The new covenant is what saves. That's what they were wanting to preserve back in the 17th century. They thought of these things 400 years ago. We just lost it. They formulated it a little differently than we do, but the same concerns were animating them and what they were doing. 
So Deneau makes a similar point in reference to dispensational elements, stating, quote, as for the Baptist approach, he means the 17th century Baptist approach, it allows for the vigorous assertion of the continuity of the covenant of grace and consequently the continuity of only one church in both Testaments, meaning one people of God, while simultaneously affirming in concert with the Bible and the dispensationalists a radical discontinuity, uh, not a radical, a discontinuity between the Old and New Covenants. Speaking of Baptist covenant theo covenantal theology as a midway, as reminiscent of the positioning of progressive covenantalism and New Covenant theology as a middle way between Pado Baptist covenant theology and dispensationalism. They were trying to do that for hundreds of years. The goal of both 1689 federalism and progressive covenantalism is, of course, to be biblical, but also to arrive at a distinctly Baptist covenantal theology. Our complaint with Reformed Baptists is that when they articulate their covenant theology, they're really assuming the superstructure, the understructure, the substructure of pedo baptism And they're saying back then, yeah, we knew that back then. That's why we rejected it back then. But the 20th century Reformed Baptists didn't know that. They didn't know that. So, these respective limbs that are growing out of both sides, they look a little different, but on this point, they're growing closer together. That's my point. The last point on the covenant of grace that shows how these two views are closer is in the new covenant. I already noted how 1689 federalism actually defines the covenant of grace as the new covenant, and they also recognize the progressive nature of the saving covenant. In the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, Article 7, it specifically emphasizes that. That language is not in the Westminster Confession that it modified. It says, by further steps, step by step, this promise of Christ's redeeming work in the new covenant is revealed. Well, that's what, that's what we've been trying to say all along. It was there, but it was obscured because they read it through the lens of the Westminster Confession. They assumed it was saying the same thing when it actually wasn't. Now we know that. And so they also recognized the progressive nature of this saving covenant. It only existed as a promise, not a formal covenant in the Old Testament. They recognized the redemptive historical tension that awaits the death of Christ and the enacting of the saving promise as the new covenant. The reason, that they don't appeal, the reason they don't appeal to the one covenant united in substance Bavarian administration formula is specifically so that they can articulate how the new covenant is new. It is new in reference to the old covenant. The new covenant replaces the old covenant. Correctly understanding the newness of the new covenant is what makes all of these views distinctly Baptist views. And so we can find fresh opportunity for theological reproachment with 1689 federalism over their clear affirmation of the newness of the new covenant replacing the old covenant. Let me move on. The Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is another area of development that demonstrates the opportunity for seeing more theological compatibility. If John Riesinger has taught us anything, it's that Abraham has more than one seed. Both dispensational theology and covenant theology err specifically on how they see the promise to Abraham's seed. Because 1689 federalism, like Progressive Covenantalism and New Covenant Theology are specifically credo-Baptist views, they're Baptist versions of covenant theology, we can see how they all similarly formulate a covenantal argument against paedo-Baptism on the Abrahamic Covenant. So, all covenantal theologies, including Reformed Baptist Covenant Theology, recognize the multifaceted nature of the Abrahamic Covenant. So everyone looks at the Abrahamic Covenant as like, look, obviously there's spiritual promises and there's physical promises in this covenant. The problem is, the dispensationalists latch on to the physical, and they say that it goes all the way through. And the Pado Baptist covenant theology, they latch on to the spiritual, and they just run all that, that through, except they keep them united together, right? So they, um, uh, the Pado Baptists, these two realities of spiritual and physical and the, the Abrahamic covenant, they exist within the same covenant, but they express themselves as an external administration and an internal substance distinction of the one covenant of grace. So they'll call about the one covenant of grace, but they just say, well, some people are only externally connected, not internally connected. And so that's how, they'll, that's how they divide up the seeds of Abraham. That's how, that's how they do it. So they, and what happens, though, is they functionally equate. They equate the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant under the banner of the one covenant of grace. And this unity in the covenant of grace is their basis for the mixed nature of regenerate and unregenerate in the covenant community, in both the old and the new covenants. So, there's, un, there's unregenerate uh, you know, covenant members in the Abrahamic covenant, same thing in the new covenant. 
You give an Abrahamic sign, it's just updated to be sprinkling water instead of circumcision. But they equate the Abrahamic New Covenant. That's what they do. They do it. And so, however, though, Baptist covenantal theologies reject this formulation to arrive at a distinctive Baptist covenantal theology and ecclesiology specifically concerning the Abrahamic Covenant. Salter, in his article, just summarizes this fundamental divide. He says, the difference between Reformed Paedobaptists and Reformed Credobaptists lies here. Where the Reformed Paedobaptists would affirm the dual aspect of the Abrahamic Covenant across the covenants, the Reformed Credobaptists would argue that in the New Covenant, there's no dual aspect any longer. So you, you can't be a member of the New Covenant and just be externally connected to the administration and not be internally connected to the substance. If you're saved, you're saved in the New Covenant. If you're not saved, you're not part of the New Covenant. And so we only give the sign of the covenant to those who have professed faith in Christ. That's why we're Baptists. Right? So, 1689 Federalism and Progressive Covenantalism both agree that the New Covenant does not contain this dual aspect. And they get from, but the question is, how do we get from the Abrahamic Covenant to the New Covenant? Because in the Abrahamic Covenant, there was this kind of, you, you can be unregenerate and be part of the Old Covenant. Right? That's why the New Covenant's better. Because it's not like that. That's the whole point. So, how do we get from this Old Covenant situation to the New Covenant situation? Because that's what was happening there. Well, the Pado Baptists, the Presbyterians, they say, well, it's just the same. Just the same. Well, it doesn't change. One covenant of grace. The Baptists say, no, there is a change. But how do we explain that change? How do we get from the Abrahamic covenant arrangement to the new covenant? So, I think the way to explain that, and, and so both, both of our Baptist covenantal views get there in a similar way. Through the progression of the covenants as redemptive history unfolds, we see a two-stage fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, which then results in significant discontinuities between the old and the new covenant. So Wellam writes, quote, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant will occur in two stages. First, in the nation of Israel, who will live in the promised land and serve as a kingdom priest under the Mosaic covenant. And second, in Christ, Abraham's royal singular seed will bless all nations, which occurs in the fulfillment of the new covenant. So some in 1689 Federalism want to describe this two-stage fulfillment as Abrahamic, as two Abrahamic covenants. Some will use that language. Each corresponding to the respective physical and spiritual seeds of Abraham. But whether or not you want to talk about a two-covenantal, like two Abrahamic covenants, and some, some in covenant theology actually argue that too, or you want to just talk about a two-stage fulfillment, either way, it shows a discontinuity, right? The new covenant is different than the old covenant. So, my point is, in either case, they're, 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 becoming, they're arriving at Baptist convictions. But 1689 Federalism is still calling their view a covenant theology. That's what's confusing for people on our side of the tree. They still call their view covenant theology. But it, uh, underneath the surface, it's functioning very different and distinctively like a Baptist view. So they recognize the importance of distinguishing the multiple seeds of Abraham precisely because they're a Baptist version of covenant theology. So I consider this a significant advancement towards reproachment that we can have some dialogue around that wasn't available in a previous generation. So in the Mosaic Covenant, I'll go there, because maybe this is the one where, like, well, there's no way to get past that one, right? Well, hold on a second. If you're staying with me, stay with me now. Don't give up now. <laughs> Having discussed the New Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, let's turn now to the Mosaic Covenant. Okay, so when we think about how Reformed Baptists over the last 60, 70 years have talked about the Mosaic Covenant, they really followed their Presbyterian mentors in describing the Mosaic Covenant as essentially gracious because it was an administration of the covenant of grace. Makes sense. Has to work that way. That was a specific point of dispute for New Covenant theology, which rightly recognized that the New Covenant replaced the Old Covenant. But they also at times spoke of the Old Covenant in negative and even legalistic terms. The 1689 Federalism limb moves away from the Reformed Baptist Covenant Theology branch by instead referring to the Mosaic Covenant as a works covenant. So they actually call the Mosaic Covenant a works covenant. That's how they refer to it. On the other side of the tree, growing out of the New Covenant Baptist branch, Progressive covenantalism has specifically developed the gracious nature of the Old Covenant. So their limb is growing away from New Covenant theology branch on this point. On the surface, it seems like 
these two limbs, 16 and Federalists and Progressive Covenants, are characterizing the nature of the Mosaic Covenant in exactly opposite categories. Right? Is the Mosaic Covenant a covenant of works or a gracious covenant? Sam Ranahan, representing 1689 view, states that for 1689 Federalism, the Mosaic Covenant was a covenant of works for temporal life in the land of Canaan. Whereas Tom Schreiner, who represents progressive covenantalism, clearly states that the covenant with Israel was gracious. However, speaking of covenants as being one of works or of grace can be slippery terms. And we can easily talk right past each other and not actually know what we're saying. It's important, once again, to push past superficial differences and get under the hood and see what is actually being asserted by these statements in the context in which they're made. So, 1689 federalism is linking the Mosaic Covenant with the Abrahamic Covenant of circumcision and therefore emphasizing the earthly, temporal, national orientation of these covenants in contrast to how they understand the new covenant, as this thing as a covenant promise to Abraham since Genesis 3.15. In distinction from how the Westminster Federalism understands the Mosaic Covenant as administration of the Covenant of Grace. 1689 Federalism argues that the Mosaic Covenant is essentially one of works because it is built off the Abrahamic Covenant. But that assertion only makes sense when they split apart the multiple seeds of Abraham into more than one covenant, or at least different fulfillments. So the Mosaic Covenant is linked with just one of the seeds of Abraham. And together, this Abrahamic covenant of circumcision and the Mosaic covenant are simply what's referred to as the old covenant. It's that old covenant, the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision, using the language of Acts 7, 7, uh, Acts 7 and uh, the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision and the Mosaic covenant that are together contrasted with and replaced by the new covenant. So that's their view. Now when Schreiner, so that's why they call it a works covenant, but when Schreiner, who represents progressive covenantalism, argues for the gracious nature of the covenant of Israel, he's not seeking to communicate that it provides saving grace in itself, or it's an administration of the covenant of grace. That's not what he means. The context for these comments is the gracious redemption of Israel from slavery in Egypt in the stage one fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Schreiner is disagreeing with those who might identify the covenant of Israel as a legalistic covenant, as if in the case salvation, in this case, salvation is based on works. So in arguing that the Mosaic Covenant is not legalistic, Schreiner means something similar to what Ranahan, the 1689 guy, means when he says the Mosaic Covenant is not the covenant of works, emphasizing the the, by which eternal life can be earned through obedience. Neither side saying that. Neither side saying that. Conversely, when Schreiner is maintaining God's gracious dealings of Israel in the Mosaic Covenant, he's saying something similar to what Ranahan writes when he talks about God's kindness and graciousness in the Mosaic Covenant. I'm going to skip down. So, I'm going to summarize here, but basically, in this works and grace language concerning the Mosaic Covenant, neither Baptist covenantal theology is arguing that either salvation can be earned by obedience to the law, the covenant of works, or that salvation is administered directly by the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant of grace. In emphasizing the gracious nature of the Mosaic Covenant, part of what progressive covenantalism is doing it's pushing back against, right? It's growing out of, but in opposite direction. It's pushing back against the legal and sometimes negative description of the Mosaic Law Covenant offered by some proponents of New Covenant theology. That's why I say it's growing this way. On the other hand, when 1689 Federalism is emphasizing the works nature of the Mosaic Covenant, they are pushing back against both the Pado baptists Presbyterians, the Westminster Federalism, and also the 20th century Reformed Baptists who follow their Pado baptist covenantal mentors. Though their terms and polemical partners are opposite, progressive covenantalism and 16 and federalism are actually arriving at a very similar place with regard to the Mosaic Covenant, and this provides grounds for fresh and friendly conversations about this in a way that we could never have several decades ago. So, but the law. The law, a hallmark of both New Covenant theology and progressive covenantalism has been to view the law as a unit and not break it up into the tripart distinctions as the hermeneutical means of determining continuity and discontinuity of the Old Covenant law for New Covenant believers. You know, we don't just say, oh, that's moral, so it stays. Oh, that's civil and ceremonial, that, that's gone, right? We don't do that. That's what, that's what New Covenant theology has always argued from the beginning. 1689 Federalism does use the language of the trifold division of the law because it is found in the Second London Confession. So you might say, okay, non-starter, 
we get off the train here of reproachment right at the law. Nice try, Richard, but we're stuck here. Okay, well, hold on. However, 1689 Federalism appeals to an even more fundamental distinction in the law that undergirds the moral, civil, and ceremonial law. Namely, you'll find more language, more commonly, they'll talk about natural and positive law. Here's how Ranahan describes them. Natural law refers to the universal moral law of God impressed on the mind of man. Okay. Positive law refers to the indifferent things prescribed or proscribed for a particular period, place, and people. Elsewhere, he calls natural law moral, and he connects it to the Decalogue when he writes, God delivered the moral law to Israel, summarized in the Ten Commandments. And he continues by locating the civil and ceremonial as subsets of positive law in writing that Israel's positive laws are often split up into two groups, the civil and the ceremonial law. This more fundamental distinction, though, between natural and moral law on one side and positive law, that's, I think, essentially what some New Covenant theology authors have appealed to in describing the basic distinction between absolute and covenantal law. Gary Long describes these two distinct categories of biblical law in this way. He says, God's absolute law, his unchanging law, individually and personally binds all mankind by virtue of their being created in God's image, regardless of dispensational and covenantal distinctions. But God's covenantal law covenantally binds only those who are in the covenant community according to the terms of the covenant enforced at a specified time within redemptive history. That's what Gary Long says. I find that very helpful. So, really, in referring... Uh, even though this positive and natural law terminology has some historical pedigree, I think it's clearer to use Gary's language, right? Dr. Long's language. Covenantal laws is clear because it ties these changes directly to God's covenantal relationships with his people. And Ranahan agrees that positive laws change with different covenantal arrangements. He writes, in addition to these universal and abiding laws, natural, moral, absolute laws, whatever language you want to use, the scripture speaks of other laws that rose and fell with specific covenants. These are positive laws. The reason there are universal, abiding, absolute moral laws is, as Wellham reminds us, first and foremost, the law of God, we have to think about God himself. It's God's moral character that determines what's ultimate and absolute. And as God commands his people, he does change covenantally. I'm going to uh, summarize. Uh, too much to say. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I could say more on the ethics question. I'll come back to those questions. But so um, here's what might be surprising to both New Covenant theology and progressive covenantalism. That because 1689 federalism emphasizes the newness of the New Covenant replacing the Old Covenant, they also are using language that seems more familiar in reference to what applies and what doesn't apply. So here's some quotes. Consider these statements. Quote, the, this is from 1689 Federalism. The whole law of Moses, as it functioned under the Old Covenant, has been abolished, including the Ten Commandments. Not one jot or tittle of the law of Moses functions as Old Covenant law anymore, and to act as if it does constitutes redemptive historical retreat and neo-Judaizing. Same author continues his argument writing, however, to acknowledge that the law of Moses no longer functions as old covenant law is not to accept there's no longer functions. It simply no longer functions as old covenant law. This can be seen by the fact that the new covenant teaches both the abrogation of the law of the old covenant and its abiding moral validity under the new covenant. Later he states, it must be granted that the redemptive historical change brought about by Christ's death and the inauguration of the new covenant causes the application of the law to differ. But this is not to say the law is canceled in all respects. Simply put, the Christian ethic involves the whole Bible. The abrogation of the Old Covenant does not cancel the utility of the Old Testament. That's the same emphasis that Wellam makes when arguing that our New Covenant ethic has to be based on the whole Bible. The whole Bible applies to us as Scripture, even though we're not directly under the Old Covenant law as a covenant document. That's what they're saying very similarly. So, with these simple statements, progressive covenantalism will agree. But of course, as the proverbial saying goes, the devil's in the details. <laughs> it must be remembered that the abiding validity of any old covenant law is not found in its old covenant expression, but because it reflects God's character, established in creation norms, and imprinted on the human conscience, and is now applicable to us in the context of the new covenant. Wellam is right to remind us that it is important 
not to exaggerate the differences between progressive covenantalism and covenant theology and doing ethics, so we could add in the other views too, because at the end of the day, all these views arrive at very similar conclusions regarding God's moral law today. So, now what about the Sabbath? This will be the last major one that I'll conclude. You're like, surely, surely there's no opportunity for approachment when it comes to the Sabbath. If we didn't get off the last train, we got to get off in this stop. Well, maybe there's some opportunity. Opportunity. This fundamental distinction in natural and positive law also helps in navigating discussions around the Sabbath. The 1689 argument is willing to see positive law aspects to the fourth command that rise and fall with covenants because change from one covenant because there's change from one covenant to another so at least part of the decalogue they are not reading transcovenantally so i want to ask these 1689 brothers how do you decide what is and is not part of this creation ordinance as you argue how do you know which parts are natural and which parts are positive law? They might appeal to the New Testament teaching and practice of not being on the seventh day, but the church gathering on the first day. Well, okay then, if you do that, that's what our branch, the Progressive Covenantal and New Covenant Theology branch, has been arguing all along. Besides, it's not, it's not a positive addition to creation. The seventh day is built into creation. But at the very least, they're willing to say that the Decalogue is not an exact replication of the moral law, but a summary that has some parts that change covenantally. Some parts are tied to the Old Covenant and not repeated in the New Covenant. This is at least the foundation for a helpful conversation that breaks through the logjam on this issue. Also, I think because 1689 Federalism is a distinctly Baptist covenantal theology, it cracks the door open for another angle to discuss the contentious Sabbath issue. 1689 Federalism, along with both groups in our branch, affirms the typological trajectory and final consummation of the Sabbath rest that awaits the return of Christ, right? That's, that's when it happens. But even someone like Barcellus would argue that it is, quote, an over-realized eschatology of the inner advental period, close quote, to not observe the physical Sabbath while we await final spiritual rest. Okay, that's their argument. I get that. However, when they say that, when they make that argument against our branch, it's very reminiscent of the same one leveled against all Baptist covenantal theologies by our pedo baptist covenant theology friends in reference to why the new covenant community currently remains mixed. It's based on physical descent while we wait for the pure spiritual church that only comes at Christ's return. They're using the same argument, the same argument that's used against us, they're using against other Baptist views. So, Reformed pedo baptists argue that the newness of the new covenant, that the Baptist covenantal theology is affirmed for their creative baptism, and also an over-realized eschatology. Progressive covenantalism consistently argues the same nature of typological fulfillment. If the new covenant theology wants to jump on board too, that's fine. Um, uh, same nature of typological fulfillment for the new covenant with regard to the issue of the baptism and the Sabbath. On um, both issues, progressive covenantalism, and we can say at least... Uh, some New Covenant theology, charges that Reformed pedo baptists and all Sabbatarians, whether it's the Presbyterian or Baptist variety, have not properly reckoned with the newness of the New Covenant, and therefore they have an under-realized eschatology. So on what grounds does 1689 Federalism apply inaugurated eschatology one way with reference to baptism, but another way with reference to the Sabbath? They would seem to be in danger of losing the consistency of their covenantal argument for credo baptism and their desire to maintain their Sabbatarianism. My point in raising this here is simply to say once again, the 1689 Federalism is a distinctly Baptist version of covenant theology which emphasizes the newness of a new covenant and it provides a largely shared understanding of hermeneutics and the biblical covenants that could even open up more fruitful dialogue around something as contentious as the Sabbath. Perhaps even on the fourth commandment, we can find some level of reproachment. I could say more about covenants of works and grace. I'm just going to skip to my conclusion here. So in conclusion, I want to conclude with a few reflections on what, on what is contributing to this and what is a barrier to this reproachment, in my opinion. So there's been other things besides this that have contributed to this reproachment. It's been a help to be able to come back together. So first of all, if this, is, this has even been a development since I've 
been in seminary and graduated seminary, there's been an increased emphasis on theological retrieval and confessional identity. That was not really a thing, I would say, when I first went to seminary in 2003, but now it's all the rage at almost every seminary. And most of it is good, most of it. The old paths usually are the best paths when it comes to things like the doctrine of God and other things, and there's a certain security in working within confessional boundaries. It keeps you doctrinally down a a tried and true path. So I think that people want to find a confession to land in. And so because of that, there's been fresh look at these, what these confessions mean, and Baptists on all sides of this branch are wanting to find a common confessional identity. And so that's enabling them to talk to each other in fresh ways that they weren't before. Also, social media has become a form, a form for theological discourse that just wasn't around 10, 20 years ago. Some of it's bad, but some of it's good. You get real-time questioning. So before you get too far down a path, someone can ask you a question and you have to answer it. And it democratizes scholarly engagement. A lot of seminary professors have Twitter accounts and they interact with people. So you can get the best version of people's views instead of just caricatures that you heard second or third hand. Also, there's been a mainstreaming of a species of new covenant theology in the label of progressive covenantalism. Some people might like that, some might not, but just, I'm just describing, I think, somewhat objectively what happened. In progressive covenantalism, there is uh, an air of academic respectability because of who the authors are that are doing it. There's a scholarly refinement and a nuanced presentation. There's an established published canon. You don't have to wonder, well, what is progressive covenantalism? Your version or your version or your version? Well, how do I know? What website do you go to? Well, no, you have to read these books published by these publishing houses, by these professors. Also now, as of recently, like last two months, there is the beginnings of a full orb systematic theology. That's never existed for New Covenant theology. And now, in the, under the label of progressive covenantalism, there is multi-volume work that you can point to. That's what we believe on every doctrinal loci. Also, fourthly, things that have aided this reproachment is that there's just new personalities without personal history. So, a lot of times these conversations can happen in supervised academic contexts, like we're having conversations at Evangelical Theological Society, not just on, you know, commenting on blogs. And I, I'm aware of some of this cantankerous history that has come from New Covenant Theology and Reformed Baptists, but I haven't personally experienced it. And at one level that makes me disconnected, at another level I can more objectively maybe look at it, because I'm not bringing personal baggage with it. That's just I'm throwing that as a suggestion. But there's also, been, there's also still remaining some barriers to these two branches with the two limbs growing closer together, some, some barriers to reproachment. It's, it's the converse of what I just said. I'll give you four things. So bad experiences. A lot of people in New Covenant theology churches and New Covenant theology movement has had a lot of bad experiences with Reformed Baptists, telling them they're sinning because they went out to lunch on Sunday after church or telling them they're not orthodox enough because they don't hold the Second London Confession, or just a heavy-handed pastoral demeanor, or whatever. And so you fled, you liked the doctrines of grace, but you fled those churches because you felt like they emphasized the, the Decalogue more than the New Covenant in Christ. And so you're like, ah, eh, I don't even want to bother. I got a bad taste in my mouth. It's not worth talking to those folks. Or, there's also another barrier to reproachment is what I'll call a vocal minority. I think that's accurate. Some, it, it, it is a barrier that some in New Covenant theology have denied imputed active obedience. It is a barrier that some in New Covenant theology have articulated their hermeneutics in such a way that it's resulted in credible antinomian accusations. I've seen it in print. It is a barrier to reproachment that some so argue against the covenants of works and grace that they sound like they're arguing against the law gospel paradigm undergirding our view of justification. And that's a major stumbling block for reproachment. Also, for those within New Covenant theology, which I hope are the majority who disagree with the things I just said, the fact that they are tolerated as acceptable differences within the New Covenant theology umbrella is also a barrier to more theological unity between these various theological credo-baptist camps. Thirdly, 
I'm not, I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm just calling a strike a strike and a foul a foul. That's how I see it. Uh, thirdly, I'll call this entrenched terminology. So here's the reality. Once you're in print, or you've put uh, a label on your church website, or it's the name of an institution holding to a certain view, like New Covenant Theology, you become committed to that expression of your theology with that terminology. It's really hard to change once you just get to a certain stage of life. For all of us. You're not rethinking the whole doctrinal foundations of your beliefs. You're like, ah, it's been working for me for a couple of decades. I'm good where I am. I don't need to read all this new stuff. I'm just going to keep teaching the Bible. And there's a certain simplicity to that, and I appreciate that. I'm not, I'm not even poo-pooing that. I'm just describing that's what happened. That's why you see more of the movement, the younger generation. So if you've been teaching your church for decades new covenant theology, and then all of a sudden, hey, you know what? <laughs> Never mind. Let's stop calling it that. Uh, everyone now, we're going to be uh, rooting for a different team now. We'll put on new shirts called Progressive Covenantalism. You know, it's just not likely to happen. It just becomes entrenched terminology. And, and, but that becomes a barrier for reproachment in some cases. And lastly, I'll say one more thing. Uh, there's just dispos dispositional differences. What I mean here is an attitude. Some people, just because of the way they're wired, they just like to emphasize the differences and accent accentuate those and not emphasizing where we're, we're similar. And I think Christian charity demands that we look for areas of agreement and not fixate on areas of disagreement. We can have disagreements, and we can have principled disagreements, and we can have clearly defined disagreements. But in many cases, that doesn't have to be a case for separation, and working together. And so going back to our forest analogy, I'd like to see more trees that are covenantal, Calvinistic, and Credo Baptist in our forest. And if we just focus on developing our limb, we're not gonna plant more trees. And so maybe there's an opportunity to just have more trees, even if the limbs grow in some different directions sometimes. That's, that's the spirit in which I offer this at least. Let me, uh, like our brother Greg, close with the benediction. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.